This is the Tom Bigby Tales, and I'm your host, Shannon Evans. I write about a small town in northeast Mississippi on the Tom Bigby River called Columbus, and sometimes I write about the rest of the state. This episode is part three of the series Heritage Academy, where some are more equal than others. I'm getting a lot of feedback, mostly positive and supportive of the investigative work I've been doing on Heritage Academy and its current or formerly current to 2023-2024 school year. I have also been sent bullying messages making ludicrous assumptions about my purpose behind my work and my experience with Heritage. There are entire threads on Facebook of people talking about me, but no one has actually refuted any of the evidence of the statements that I have made about the recent events and the current batch of new hires. I find that very telling. They banter about words like disgruntled former employee and jealous, but no one person on these bully pulpit threads has addressed the elephant in the room, that the school's administration is a mess, The new hires are mostly unequipped and not educated in the areas in which they teach. And the facts, well, they're ignoring the facts and merely attacking the messenger. I do not want to make the focus of this work on me and my personal experience with heritage, but in the interest of transparency and all the misinformation floating around, let me set the record straight. I was hired by Dr. Greg Carlisle. I have over 20 years experience in the world of education and hold teaching certificates in grades 5 through 12, as well as have multiple masters in instructional design, statistical analysis, as well as an MFA in creative writing that I got recently at MDW. I have worked in educational settings around the world, both public and private. I was working for a public university remotely when the pandemic forced the closure of the entire department where I worked. So the next day, someone approached me about a classroom in desperate need of a teacher with my qualifications. The pay was too low, so I said no. Carlisle asked me back to offer more money and that he was desperate because no one wanted to go back in the classroom, even with the new protocols in place, and he needed a teacher ASAP, and we were still at the tail end of the pandemic. He literally talked me into the job with the promise that I would move the next year out of the classroom and back into my true love, instructional designer, in support of the faculty at a much more lucrative pay grade. That position was never spoken of again, despite his promise, and when asked about it, the waffling began. I am a tough teacher, but I'm fair. I push those kids to prepare the freshmen and juniors and high school seniors for college. I made the kids write more than they had ever written before across the curriculum. I made them uncomfortable by making them write about little-known authors, playwrights, and poets who have shaped the literary world. I made them learn to write papers presenting all sides of an uncomfortable topic regardless of their own personal biases. I pushed them to identify their biases and gaps in understanding. I made them have to think and do scholarly research and not just repeat what they are taught to be true. They did not like how hard I pushed. Neither did their parents. But they knew I was fair. I was the teacher who sent notes through Canvas that it was getting late on the due date of a major assignment, and they had so many hours to get it in and to remind them in case they'd forgotten. I had kids so far behind in some assignments or who had scored so poorly on assessments that in a standard high school classroom, they would have been failed, but not by me because I believe in mastery learning. I don't take, I forgot, or I didn't get the directions for an answer. I gave kids extensive, effective, positive feedback on every single paper. And if they failed or did not perform to their potential on the piece, I gave them the opportunity to revise and resubmit and earn back significant point deficits so that they could learn from the process and grow as a student. That is who I was and am as a teacher. I had classes where students had significant learning differences, and I found ways to make them successful in the content and not be left behind or made to feel different. I created a safe learning environment, but I pushed those kids to the far reaches of their comfort zone. But mostly, it was not their comfort, but their parents that was challenged. I stand by the educational brain stretching I gave those kids to make them most prepared for a college education outside the bubble of Columbus, Mississippi. 
I know that every kid that left my classroom knew I had high expectations for their future academic success and that I cared that they were better human beings every day. Heritage had some excellent teachers and still does who have been there for years. They have equally high standards, but they are more cautious and follow the party line in not upsetting parents and making folks uncomfortable. I get it. They need a job. They have children in the school or grandchildren, and they don't want any blowback to impact their family. But I had no dog in that hunt. I only cared about students and them getting not just a better than Columbus High education, but an excellent education in all things English literature or college search or speech. And I am not easily intimidated by over-involved parents who want to dictate what parts of the curriculum and what version of research is permitted. But that is a different discussion. Let's just say that many families said the topics explored in my class led to a lot of interesting dinner table conversations with their teens. Due to Columbus being a small town and many of the students' parents and grandparents are relatives, neighbors, and former classmates, etc. This has a positive and negative impact on the school as it does in most small schools in equally small communities. Everyone knows everyone else's business, or thinks they do, or are one meeting away from telling it. The heritage community is no different. This creates an environment where some students do not feel safe asking for help from the people who should and normally would provide them a safe space to vent. This creates the perfect storm for caring teachers to get themselves in a bind doing the right thing to help their students. In my case, a student was in the bathroom and had not come to class. I sent another student in to find this student and check on her. The student returned and said the other student, a junior themselves, was in a super emotional state, sobbing in the bathroom, and she was worried. My student that I sent to the bathroom was worried about her friend. I could not leave the room with students. I could not reach the counselor. So I sent the student a text to see if she was okay and if she would, could go to the counselor or if she wanted another student to walk her over to the counselor. I knew texting a student was against the school was against the school rules. However, every coach and counselor on campus who signed the same rules of conduct texted their students. I even let the parents know I was concerned about their child. The child texted me back that the girl who was bullying her and her parents were in a close friendship with the school's only counselor. I told the student that the best thing she could do was wipe her tears, hold her head high, and get ready for her next class, which was just a few minutes away. That some girls live for drama, and she could choose to live in the drama, or she could choose to live above it. The young lady did go to her next class and pushed to remain out of the drama for the next nine weeks. Then I hear, nine weeks later, that the counselor is asking for my students' phones and looking for any communication via text messages I had with them. There were none others, as I always communicated with my students via school email or Canvas, all monitored by the school. The student came and told me that she was told if she did not show them her phone and text messages, she would be suspended. This was a top-tier A student who was in a very competitive education program who had never had a discipline problem. She was terrified, and she handed over her phone without even speaking to her parents. Her parents were furious that a device they owned was searched without their knowledge or consent. The school fired me that day for doing the right thing, and I will tell you, I would do it again tomorrow. It was not about the text message. That was just a technicality and a hypocritical move by Sean Harrison to remove me to appease certain parents. They wiped all my quarter grades off the grade books and told the parents I had not entered any grades in said grade book, a complete fabrication. They rehired the former teacher who was previously terrified to teach post-COVID and life went back to being comfortable for the parents of Heritage Academy. That's the story. The truth is less interesting than the rumor mill stories being sent to me. The bullying of other parents on some of the threads is telling about the toxic environment of the school. Now, enough of the gaslighting, but those parents whose children were never in my class. 
because if you have any questions, just ask. I am an open book. No need to talk behind my back like a high school mean girl. It's only a way to distract from the very real problems with Heritage Academy administration by blaming me, the messenger. And not one single mudslinger about my connection to the school has disputed the facts I have presented with any content that prove, that disproves anything that I have presented in this podcast. Instead, they turn my question about the school's actions into a personal attack on me. Clearly, this is a case of the truth has made a bunch of heritage royalty uncomfortable, and so they attack the character of the one asking the hard questions. Isn't that interesting? Now, back to heritage and the parents and students who've been emailing and calling and messaging me about the real concerns about the school and their child's safety and education. Again, the parents and former students who've reached out to me in the last 24 hours are desperate to feel heard and seen. Their personal experiences are not just concerning, but also heartbreaking. Perhaps the most seemingly innocuous concern from current students and former students is the alleged presence of male coaches in the girls' locker room. Yes, you heard me correct. The girls, once dressed for practice or games for various sports, volleyball and softball specifically, have their pregame meetings, warm-ups, etc., with the male coach in their dressing space. While this may seem harmless on the surface to an adolescent girl who's been raised and trained to respect coaches and believe they only have the girl's best interest at heart, to me and to other professionals in education, both male and female, also in the coaching in the realm, this is an alarming practice. It smacks of grooming and sends a message to girls that their all-female sanctuary for changing their clothes and showering is not a sanctuary at all. It is not a space to expect privacy. It demonstrates a total disregard for women's and girls' spaces. After school, all those classrooms in that building are for the most part empty and available for coaches to hold meetings and pregame talks. The bleachers in the gym are available too. Heck, the library is always empty after school and an excellent space to accommodate even the largest team meeting. It is unclear why, if ever, the women's locker room is the place for a male coach to hold a meeting. I'm gobsmacked that in 2024, we even need to discuss this. If there was a biologically male student in the girls' locker room, even if every student was dressed, the school would take actions for suspension and expulsion and or arrest, have the, the male arrested. So why would a male coach be allowed in there? It clearly sm smacks of grooming practices. Are parents aware of this practice? Is the administration aware? I'm just, it's just wow. No words. I have girls telling me about male teachers and coaches and fellow male students that allegedly make inappropriate or borderline inappropriate comments to them, but do not feel that their concerns will be heard by the administration. So they just tell each other or the school counselor and nothing comes of it or they fear being targeted academically. So they remain silent. The girls then feel like they are not heard and just learn to avoid certain places at certain times of day to avoid these males. <sighs> these are just the tip of the iceberg of content in some future episodes. In the meantime, why aren't the local newspapers covering these issues that I've brought forth and doing their own investigative work? Because the editors of both papers have children attending Heritage Academy High School and know like every other parent there, if they mention anything even potentially unfavorable about the school or the administration in their publication, there is a very real possibility of it impacting their children socially, emotionally, and academically at Heritage Academy. Heritage likes to call itself one big fa family. I think it's more like the Cosa Nostra. Thank you for coming on my podcast. Until the next episode.